Hey, it's Zach. The Low Post is brought to you by Goodyear, helping you discover the road ahead. Goodyear, more driven. While the NBA playoffs have now sadly ended, the Major League Baseball playoffs are down to the Final Four. The Rays, Astros, Braves, and Dodgers. I guess the Rays are not the Devil Rays anymore, just the Rays. Check out Baseball Tonight with Buster Olney, one of the absolute legends of this business, wherever you get your podcasts. And now, The Low Post. Welcome to... The Low Post Podcast, where the season is over. Everyone wants to rush into the offseason. Who are the Warriors going to take at number two? Are they going to trade? No, no. The whole goal of the NBA is to win the championship. That's what all of this is for. So I like to revel a little bit in the season and the accomplishments of people who have worked their whole lives for this moment. And in continuing a tradition that I have somehow shoehorned people into participating in, we have as our guest today, I'm thrilled and honored to have him, the head coach of the 17-time world champion Los Angeles Lakers, Frank Vogel. How are you? I'm pretty good right now, Zach. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. I'm home. I never had to go to the bubble. You're, did, did, you, did your family like remember all of your bad habits around the house that annoy them? Like, Are you getting readjusted to home life? That's completely showing up on an hourly basis. Um, yes, being back uh, living with roommates again. Yeah, that's how my daughter put it to me last night. It's like, yeah, you didn't have a roommate for three months. Now you have roommates again. <laughs> I, I should have introduced you this way. Um, Rajon Rondo got a lot of publicity for being the second player ever to win a championship as both a Celtic and a Laker. You too, Frank Vogel, are a former Boston Celtic. Have you gotten any good-natured ripping from from the ball? I guess the, probably all of your colleagues from there are gone by this point, obviously. But, I mean, you, you deserve that. You were part of the same club. Although you didn't win a title, but you, you're a former Celtic, current Laker. You're a traitor. <laughs> Correct. I, uh, I did spend seven years with the Boston Celtics, and um, I do still have a lot of friends there, uh, mostly in the front office and whatnot. Um, and, of course, you know, I'm, I'm really close. Brad Stevens is probably the, the closest head coach uh, that I'm, I am to uh, any, any other head coach in the league. So um, we've exchanged some text messages as well. And uh, yeah, I'm just, but I'm happy for Rondo. You know, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, obviously he's uh, he's had a, a great strong start to his career and bouncing around a little bit the last few years. And, um, you know, I know this was important to him, uh, you know, to sort of put that that stamp on his career, you know, to be the one, of the, the, the one guy, you know, I think the, the, the guy that did it with the Minneapolis Lakers only half counts, right? <laughs> Ooh, careful, coach. Careful. <laughs> You're gonna so, you're gonna talk yourself right out of uh, like two and a half championships in Lakers franchise history. Um, <laughs> did you take did you take like do you have a journal from this season because you have a a book sitting there to be written? Did you take any notes? Did you like jot things down? You know, I really didn't, and I all all along the way, I've obviously felt like I should be doing that, and um, had people telling me I should be doing that, and uh, you know, even before knowing what this this year was gonna going to look like um but i didn't you know i i really to me all of my focus was on this job you know what i mean and and everything that comes after that will come after that um i just felt like i didn't want anything uh pulling away from it anyway i got a good memory anyway there you go um so so let's go all the way back to the beginning um you are introduced as the head coach of the lakers and we'll get into your background a little bit later but this is this is a, a, a crowning moment of your professional life. You get to sit. It's only a press conference. I get it. But you're the subject of it. The logo of the most tied, most storied franchise in the NBA is behind you. Yeah. And you know, going into that press conference, that you are about to be asked or watch Rob Polinka be asked questions about what Magic Johnson just said on first take about backstabbing and this and that. And uh, you had to sit there and watch our Dave McMenamin ask a question that had to be asked of Rob Polinka about right. you not being the first choice. And so I wonder, did you guys huddle up before that and, and say, here's how we're going to handle the magic questions? And did you – like I watched it yesterday. Your facial expression, just calm, just no no reaction to any of the questions, just you know, sip some water. Did you, did you just have to focus on like, I'm going to let Rob handle this. I'm not going to, not going to roll my eyes. I'm not going to like make a face. Did you, were you just primed for that? I, yeah, I felt like that was really the only approach to have. Um, 
you know, I knew it was going to be directed at Rob. And for me, that was, you know, I've, I felt bad. Everyone said they felt bad for me. I felt bad for Rob, <laughs> <laughs> you know, to have that, that attention in, 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 in the press conference for the head coach. Um, but for me, it was just, uh, you know, I, I was, I was impressed with how Rob handled it. I thought he handled it with class and dignity. And, um, you know, I just quietly waited my turn. And uh, when the questions came from me, I knew, hey, at the end of the day, I got about half as many questions as I normally would have gotten. So that was just fine with me. <laughs> did you and did you and Rob watch the magic interview together? Like, where were you when that was happening? Yeah, I was just, uh, you know, either on the way to the office or preparing for, um, you know, for the press conference when it was brought to my attention that that all of that stuff was said. So I didn't watch it. You know, it was just brought to my attention that that, that stuff was said. And we just kind of huddle up and, and Rob was like, you know, I'm going to get all these questions. If you get asked, just, you know, say you're focused on, you know, your your role here and don't really have anything else to say, you know, about that. And I didn't really have anything else to say about that, you know, other than, you know, what uh, what I felt was the, the truth was that there was a, a massive perception that, there was dysfunctionality within the Lakers organization. And, you know, from the time I'd gotten there, everybody seemed pretty well connected and like, you know, we're, we're heading in the right direction. So um, I did feel like it was, uh, it was, you know, drastically different on the outside than on the inside. It's wild to watch that press conference again, because a, it's a really long time ago in like normal NBA season time, obviously um, right. longer than it would be normally. Uh, and you're sitting there talking about how LeBron fits with Lonzo Ball and Brandon Ingram. We have these young guys and someone asked you like, well, you know, LeBron and young guys, is that going to be a dynamic that really works? And you answered very well. So my question is, that's in May 2019. Two right. months later, the Los Angeles Lakers trade almost all of those guys for Anthony Davis. Did Anthony Davis's name come up in the job interview process? It did not. You know, um, it was about. Um, you know, coaching the young guys, you know, I, you know, I think they, they said something along the lines of, you know, we're always going to try to improve our team. Um, but we have uh, a lot of the young guys that we believe in and, you know, we have to, we have to get healthy and, you know, we have to sort of bridge the gap between, you know, bronze years in the league and his stature and, and the young guys uh, coming together. And, um, you know, that there's got to be a, a high level of accountability. You know, that was the, the big thing. But uh, there was no mention of Anthony Davis. Uh, obviously, you know, there was a, a lot of rumors. There was a lot talked about leading into that publicly. So I know there was, I knew there was always a possibility of that. But you know, my approach was to come in and work with the young guys and LeBron. Uh, what do you remember about the day you got Anthony Davis, which was in July, I think? Um, how did you learn about it? Uh, what was your reaction? Did you have a beer that night? Like, what, what do you remember about it? I don't remember. I probably had a beer that night. <laughs> I don't remember for sure. Um, Maybe it's in June. I think it was in June, actually. Yeah, I just uh, obviously it was a great deal of excitement. Um, the the one thing that you know, I just remember there was a lot of back and forth about um, what the deal was actually going to look like and and would it actually get done? Were we giving up too much? Um, you know, all those types of things, and you know, there was a. There was a there was a, a big feeling publicly like we did give up too much, uh, but internally um, we valued all the all the pieces that we had. You know, all, th all three of the young players we had are really good players. Brandon Ingram goes and becomes an All Star this year, um, so there was a there was a little bit of how you know did we give up too much? But you know, you get Anthony Davis like top five player in the world. You know, a, a potential MVP candidate every year, and. Um, to me and to Rob and our whole organization, it's like you just do what you have to do to, to get that guy. And um, just overwhelming excitement that we were able to get it done and strong belief in, in what we could accomplish. It just now at that point turned turned our focus to what's the rest of the roster going to look like. <laughs> I should have I should have rewatched the lottery when the Lakers move up from number 11 to number four, which is an underrated moment in the Anthony Davis pursuit. Were you, were you on yeah. the podium? I don't think you were, right? No. So I you're home? There. Yep. What do you, what, what do you, do you have any superstitions? Are you, are you walk, are you pacing while you watch it? Do you have any good luck charms? What's your lottery routine? Well, uh, I, I don't really 
think I did anything other than just sit on the couch and watch t- watch TV, <laughs> watch it all play it out. I wish I had a more interesting story, but I was just watching it and with my fingers crossed. And um, I think my daughters were really excited about, you know, um, moving up to get Zion. Like, wow, we could coach Zion. And, you know, if, if we move up to number one, <laughs> um, but I think it worked out just right. We got a, we got up to four and got a piece. Um, you know, that was able to be included in a trade for Anthony Davis, which is uh, obviously worked out really well. Did you let yourself daydream at all about Kawhi Leonard? Of course. You know, we thought we had a strong chance of, of getting Kawhi, you know. So, um, you know, there was a long stretch, um, you know, leading up to that July 1st and into that first week where, you know, we, we felt like this could happen and what, what that team could look like. Um, you know, obviously we <laughs> we were pretty good with without him. So I mean, if we would have had him, it would have been uh, pretty special. Um, but we did believe we had a chance. So so you played the Clippers opening night. You played him again on Christmas, and then you played him again right before the season shut down, if I recall. So sort of three landmark games and moments. Obviously, right. um, I don't ask this question to do the. Did the Lakers have an easier path than expected to the title? I don't care about that. There's no such thing as an easy championship in the NBA. I don't do it to disparage the Denver Nuggets, who are awesome. Like, nobody loves Nikola Jokic more than I do. Um, I do. I just want to know, having lived in L.A. for the whole year, and I know it was talked about within both teams, did part of you, like, really want the Staples Center series? Like, you're circling each other all year. You're pacing in and out of the same locker rooms. The star power, everyone in the media is anticipating it. Did part of you guys deep down like, man, that would be a lot of fun to test ourselves like that? Well, I think from a, you know, just a, a fan of sports, you, you definitely want to see that. Um, for me personally, honestly, I intentionally try not to to root for one team to win or lose or, or, uh, or root for an opponent, you know, that, that we get or a matchup. You know, I mean, whatever it is. And, and a lot of times, like, you, you can know internally, hey, this matchup's easier than that matchup. But I, I just feel like you're messing with basketball karma and messing with the basketball gods to hope for anything like that. So I really just step back and wait and see and prepare, you know, for both teams if it's 3-3 or something like that. Um, but it certainly would have been fun for our city. I, I know that. Like, I get all that. And uh, it, But it, in Orlando, I don't know if it would have had the same – yeah, no, it wouldn't have been you know, the same. Yeah, it wouldn't have been the same. But it, but to have that that type of series at Staples Center, oh. that would be remarkable. Well, the whole media was fantasizing about it because it's like the only series you don't have to get on a plane. You get there yes. and you just stay, stay in the same hotel for two weeks. <laughs> in, in L.A., that's not all bad. In, in L.A., yeah. To, for us to lose out on an L.A.-Miami finals, it, it ranks on – it's like the 159,000th bad like in on the ranking list of bad things it's like a very minor thing but boy <sighs> anyway yeah, that's a, um, that's a big miss it's a big miss um it's a long flight but it's a big miss one of the things zooming out um that i, I have really admired about you this year is when you got the job monty williams name was hovering there ty Lue's name was hovering there jason kidd's name was hovering there and we know that like you know, there was stuff with Spo early on in LeBron's tenure there, what happened to David Blatt, all that. I think it would have been very easy for you to coach afraid. Like, I, I don't know if I want to really go at LeBron about that rotation because, you know, could you know, if, if we're 0-2, like I don't really want to have this film session, blah, blah, blah. And you took it the exact other way, which was I've got nothing to lose. I'm coaching the Los Angeles Lakers. I'm going to do it my way. I'm not scared of any of this stuff. And I, I wonder if you could talk about, was that an easy, is that just your mindset overall? Was that just, did you have to even think about that? Or is that just the way you're wired after your sort of unlikely rise up to this level? Because I, I do think a lot of coaches would have been coaching not to get fired or coaching a little bit scared and you did not. Yeah. And I think it has to do with where people are in, in their lives and, and, and whatnot. And, um, you know, my, my family having moved around a lot and, and this being my third head coaching job. You know, I really just, uh, I wanted to go for it. You know what I mean? I wanted, I wanted to just lay it all out there and, and be unafraid and, um, you know, really coach my way, 
you know, because a lot of times you, you get you get coaches jobs in the NBA and, you know, you want to bend, you know, to appease your front office. You're going to bend to appease your players. And, um, you know, sometimes you, you don't always get to coach your way for, for various reasons. You want the job security. You want to ha- not have to move your family, all these types of things. And, um, you know, I, my family and I had been through a lot. So I was going to do it my way and, you know, live with the results, you know, and, and if, if that meant that it didn't work out and, you know, we could, you know, go back to either Indiana or Florida or wherever we were going to be as a family, um, you know, I could live with that. But, you know, but this is going to be a, a situation where, you know, I didn't call a bunch of people asking what LeBron James was like, you know, what Anthony Davis was like, you know, I, I, I just, I said, you know what, I, I know what I'm doing. Uh, I got a strong belief. I've really studied the game over the last few years and how it's transitioned from the mod to the modern NBA on uh, both sides of the ball. And uh, I believed in my plan. So uh, I definitely wanted to, to have a go for it mindset with this, uh, with this year's team, with this season. Uh, it's interesting. You mentioned that you didn't call, cause I, I was reading a previous interview you did early in the season when you, you said people had asked you, have you called Luke Walton? Have you called their exposure just to get, some intel, some background, how did it work? And you said, actually, no, I don't want to do that. I, I want to go in, I want to go in fresh. Is that what, what, is that just, how did you make that decision? Because I think that's very interesting. Most coaches would have gone, like everyone wants information, you know what I mean? Yeah, and I think uh, when when a lot of that stuff isn't documented, you know, it's 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 always beneficial it is to if you don't have familiarity with a player call the college coach or something like that i think that's always beneficial um but lebron in, in particular was such a iconic figure and um you know the, the the bumps in his road with some of his his former coaches uh, were well documented you know to me uh diving into those you know was posed a risk of um tainting my my perception of the situation of the relationship. I just wanted to start fresh with a, a blank canvas uh, with he and I, you know, obviously I haven't competed against each other, but uh, beginning a re- relationship anew. And I didn't want to have any, any, anybody else, uh, you know, um, sway my perceptions of, of, of how it was going to play out. So, uh, you know, I was happy I did that. And, you know, the season went really well for us. <laughs> it, I think it did. Um, I want to go back to the beginning of your career because I, I, I think people know that what has happened to you is improbable on some level, although you've earned it. It's it's your work that, that has done it. But I've read many accounts of your carving out a job for yourself at Kentucky under Rick Pitino. OK, so I've read many different accounts of this in the mid 90s. My favorite one goes like this. And I really hope this is basically how it is. <laughs> you send Rick Pitino a bunch of letters. Basically, like probably handwritten letters or typed. I don't know. Handwritten or typed. 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 Yep. Yep. Dear coach, like any job, I, I want to. You're you're playing Division three at that point. Like I want to be a coach. Any job. No one ever answers your letters. You get no reply. This is the account that I want to be true. Okay. So you let me just okay. speak it, and then you can tell me what's true. <laughs> you then, having gone all this time without getting a reply, go to some Nike camp or whatever camp where you know he's going to be, and you like orchestrate. Oh, I'm, I'm. Oh, hey, whoa, Coach Patino, wild to bump into you. I'm the guy who wrote you a thousand letters that your secretary probably threw in the trash. And Rick and Jim O'Brien, I guess maybe is there too. Sort of gives you a, a oh, hey, um, yeah, it's okay. hey, hey, Frank, nice to meet you. If you're ever in Kentucky, look us up. And you take that as a personal invitation to get in the car and move your entire life to Kentucky and be like, well, you told me if I was in town uh, to look you up. Is that what happened, really? Pretty much. Um, I did. I did receive letters from the University of Kentucky from Rick Pitino, just a form letter. Thank you for interest. We don't have anything. Um, so I was getting letters back. Uh, I, I knew it wasn't him. It was probably secretary. But um, I did go uh, to try to work five star basketball camp with the uh, sole purpose of trying to meet Rick Pitino and get in front of him and, uh, and, and talk to him because I didn't think the letters were actually getting through to him. And, um, you know, obviously it's not hard to, uh, it's not, wasn't easy to work five star. They don't just allow anybody. You have to be invited there as well. So I had to write some letters to get in there. When I got there, um, you know, the camp director, Howard Garfinkel introduced me to, to coach Patino when he came to recruit, which I knew he would come to recruit. 
and was able to just uh, tell him what I was trying to do, that I had written letters to try to be equipment manager, walk on, whatever I could do. Um, but I felt like I could help him. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's something I, I try to tell uh, young aspiring coaches that you don't want to beg for an opportunity. You want to sell how you can help that coaching staff. And, um, you know, Rick, uh, he, he did say, you know, like you just said, well, if you if you decide to come down and, and we can help you in any way, look us up. <laughs> and yes, I said, uh, that's enough. You know, I was just looking for any little crack in the door. And, um, you know, at least I had that frame of reference. If, if I got down there, it wasn't working out. You know, I could I could go knock on the basketball offices and uh, try to sell myself again and try to make something happen. That was enough for me. I mean, that's <laughs> that's a crazy story, Coach. To, from from there to here is, yeah. is a crazy story. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt, Division Three. I mean, Division Three with you know really no basketball contacts in 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 a you know big time uh, uh, frame of reference. Division One NBA. I didn't know a single person. So you know, and that that was part of the move. You know, um, you could be the best in the world as an aspiring young coach, but if you don't know the right people, you know, the doors don't open. And, um, you know, part of that was just uh, a learning from uh, someone like Rick Pitino and his staff learning about that level. I had never been around a division one program or, or anything like that. Um, and then also, you know, just trying to, to earn some contra- uh, contacts. And they're loaded. I mean, Kentucky's always loaded, but that 96 team was like capital L loaded with yes. talent. Yes, and there were some teams that came after that that were as loaded, but at the time, it was probably the most talented basketball team in college college basketball I'd ever seen. Wow. We had we had nine NBA players on the team. That's insane. Is Antoine Walker still on that team, or is he in the NBA by then? He he actually uh, – He might have been one came, year in. He came in my second year. Oh, okay. No, he was – yeah, he was, he was on that team. I was there from 94 to 97. I think he came in 95. Twan's one of my all-time favorite NBA players. Anyway, that's a whole – my Antoine Walker Walker thing is a whole different story. Um, You were studying biology, Coach, to be like – you were going to be pre-med at one point. Do you have any – do you have any biology left in the – has it been helpful in reading coronavirus articles? Do you have any biological information left in there? Cellular structures, anything like that? Zero. (laughs) Nothing. (laughs) I have a four-year – I have a degree in, in biology. Um, I, I wanted to be a doctor, you know, I thought, and then when I did two years of pre-med, uh, when I first got to college, I was working round the clock to get to grades and I was under a three Oh, and I knew I wasn't getting into med school and I felt like I was giving it my all and, uh, just wasn't as passionate about it, uh, as it was with basketball. And, did you get to organic uh, chemistry? I got through, uh, organic chemistry with a very low grade, but I did that's get the through. killer. That's, or, that's, or the, that's the one that. Yeah, one and two. Um, but the upper level classes, th- those are the ones that were just stupid hard, like incredibly ridiculously hard. Histology, um, you know, uh, I forget what, what all of them microbiology, um, physiology, like, like all, all, all those upper. The histology one where, where you, you're dissecting thousands and thousands of cells, like they all look the same to me. <laughs> I just remember I dated a pre-med student as an undergrad. And when she got to organic chemistry, I was like, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to be around you for the next three or four months. Cause this is a little, this is a little much for me to handle. And I'm not even taking a class. Yeah. That's, that's the worst class that anybody could ever take. It's it, the models. It's impossible. Who was the first phone call that you made after you guys won the title the other night, the first outgoing call, who's your first call? Man, um, well, I called my my wife uh, Jen from the locker room. You know, she was at the game. She was up uh, across the way. Um, you know, not like on our side in the bubble, but uh, where the media was. And uh, so I called her and my daughters on Facetime from the locker room right before uh, you know the, the the champagne celebration. You know that we had, and uh, you know that was the first one. And I don't think I made an outgoing call again until I probably till I got home, you know, because they were there and, you know, I just spent the moment with, with them. So, uh, that was the, that was the first outgoing They but could they come to the, to the celebration afterwards? Yeah, they, they didn't, they, they couldn't come down in the court or the locker room or anything, but they could go, uh, to the hotel again, not in the, the rooms in the hotel, but to the restaurant they had on the lake. Uh, so they allowed them to go to the party and, um, 
I was able to see them for the first time. I got running hugs from my daughters, a uh, moment I'll never forget. I uh, got it on video, I think. I was trying to video as they were jumping on, jumping on me and stuff. And, uh, yeah, what a moment. Uh, what's the first incoming call that you actually took? Because your phone just must be going absolutely bonkers. For It's probably still going bonkers. <laughs> but what's the one that you saw flash? And was like, I, I actually got to take this one. Well, well, George Hill FaceTimed me that night like while I was at the party and everything and I did not pick up. And, uh, you know, again, I didn't, I didn't get any, uh, incoming, uh, would, uh, in, incoming one. John Calipari called me too. Uh, again, when I was I, like, I didn't even see that red ring, uh, during the party and everything. Um, but then George called me again, <laughs> he FaceTimed me again from Greece, I guess he's, he's over in Greece. And he was like, yeah, but I knew that if you didn't pick up a second time, like we were going to be done. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad i picked up you wanted to congratulate me and uh just talk you know talk about how happy he was for me so that was the, that was the second one and i talked have you heard from coach patino yet uh, over text yep okay. yeah over text super proud and um i've heard from just about everybody um i i asked every coach that's come on after this moment this question and i found it's it's there is usually a good answer to it you're the party's going on it's just your team and the loved ones, right? The, everyone else is shut out of it, which is the way it should be. And people are all going around the room, milling around, talking to each other. Um, there's, I just wonder, is there a conversation that you had that you're going to take? I mean, obviously there are a lot of them, but is, was there one that maybe it surprised you the depth of it or something that someone said to you, whether it's a player, a coach or genie or whoever, that, that you – are going to take with you for a long time as like a real flashbulb memory of that night. You know, um, obviously, like you said, there's, you know, you, there's a lot of conversations like that. I think um, the one that comes to mind most is, is with Rajan Rondo, you know, and uh, we both just sort of reflected back um, on the first phone call uh, that, that we made after Kawhi signed with the Clippers. And it was like, okay, now, Okay, we got all this cap space saved for him. Now we got to go use it and fill out the rest of our roster. We put together the rest of our roster in about three hours. And, um, you know, a lot of that that day was about um, me getting on the phone with DeMarcus Cousins and with Rajon Rondo and with Danny Green and, you know, guys like that and JaVale McGee and, and just making sure they felt good about their role of what they were, they were coming. You know, they, they obviously um, – you know, wanted to be here. They wanted to play with LeBron and have this opportunity with, with AD, but they wanted to make sure it, it looked and felt right. And, um, you know, I told him at that point that there's, there's maybe no coach in, in, in the NBA that's a bigger fan of Rajon Rondo than I am. And, um, so he just, uh, he took a moment, uh, to just, you know, thank me for believing in him. And, um, when that to me that's like one of the the best moments as a coach is when when you show confidence or belief in someone um and kcp and i had a similar conversation you know because he was he was being highly criticized early in the season um when you show confidence and belief in someone and they reward you with great play and it, it ends up in this situation leading to a championship uh that's just special and uh something i'll never forget and that's you know, above all else, like that's what you do this job for, you know, for, for those types of moments. Speaking of stuff you'll never forget, um, what do you, what are you, what are the memories you'll always take from you from what has to be the most bizarre road trip in the history of the NBA, which is the Lakers and the Nets preseason trip to China? I was reading back on that and um, you guys were, actually had one practice where you, I think you were hustled off the court really quickly, right? So, and then you're in the meeting, I think, when Adam Silver and LeBron go back and forth a little bit. So, like, and then, of course, the banners are coming down, the whole geo, you're in the middle of a geopolitical, not scandal, but something. So, maybe it's the practice, maybe it's Conflict. that meeting. What, what, what do you, what do you remember from the, what, what do you take with you? Well, <laughs> uh, I, I remember feeling self, uh, cautiously safe, but a little bit afraid. Uh, because, you know, obviously in a, in a communist country, if, if you're on the outs with the government, um, they don't have to let you leave. 
you know, and <laughs> like, I didn't think it would go in that direction, but you're, none of us really knew. And there was like, everybody had stories about a Nike trip or whatever. And, you know, when they, people didn't do something the wrong way, they just hold your flight for six hours and, and they're telling you, you're not going to be able to leave the country. And, you know, the NBA, uh, you know, through Daryl Morey's, his tweet, um, and then the, not the support of the message from Adam Silver, but the support of freedom of speech, which is what our country is all about, really put Adam Silver and the whole NBA, uh, you know, on the outs with the with the Chinese government. So, um, you know, we felt like we were enemies of the state. And, you know, in, in some ways, you know, that, that it could go in a, in a really bad direction. So, um, you know, just that, that overall feeling of like, would we be able to leave was, was um, you know, prevalent throughout the whole thing. And then, you know, the, the one thing that sticks out to me is uh, the moment my players kind of went to bat for me because the, the league was like, we got to do something about the media, like all, all the Chinese media and, and even the American media was over there. Like they wanted to hear from us, like what was going on? You know, there was no statements. There was no like, are they going to make the players available? Is, is the coach is going to be available? Is, um, you know, who's going to talk to the media? And at one point, the NBA said, let's just let's just take it off the player's plate. Let the coaches go out and, and answer uh, the, the, those questions. And, you know, obviously, there's a lot of risk there. If you say the wrong thing, you know, when when you're in, in that type of situation, uh, it could go uh, the wrong direction. <laughs> so, um, you know, there was a, a point where I stood up and was like, I'm, I'm comfortable, you know, just uh, navigating through this, you know, and, and uh, being a leader for our, our whole group that was over there. And Kenny Atkinson was uh, was on board as well, and uh, our players were like, "No, we're not. We're not letting you do that. We're not. We're not going to let the league throw you to the fire." And um, you know, so we appreciate it, coach, but no, that's not happening. <laughs> so um, you know, that was a, a great showing of support for my my guys, and uh, something I always appreciate. Then in the bubble, the Bucks initiate a strike. Um, for completely righteous and just reasons. And there's a, a meeting that night where essentially everybody's there. And as a reporter who's not there, I'm texting and calling and you're trying to navigate this weird feeling inside yourself, which is you are um, I, like me personally, I, I'm the issues that they are protesting are issues of such fundamental human rights that they're, they way supersede anything the 2020 NBA season is about. On the other hand, I have a job and part of my job is like, is the 2020 NBA season going to continue? That's a, that's an immediate storyline. Right. Right. And then the tweets come out that the Lakers and the Clippers have voted to stop the season, which I think maybe those were a little bit um, hyperbolic, but was there ever a moment where you thought, we really might, we really might just go home. Like my, this, this chance we have to win a title it, it, for reasons that are again, way bigger than basketball, way bigger than me, way bigger than Frank Vogel, whatever. Like it, it may be, it may be going. Yeah. For three days we were unsure, you know, um, I know our group always had the intent to, uh, to finish this thing, finish this out. And, um, you know, obviously we had a, a couple guys that, um, you know, we're heavier hearted on the, the social justice issues. Um, so, you know, while that, all that was going on, you know, I thought there was, you know, there was a potential for us to not finish, but, you know, I just knew where our particular team and our leadership was that, you know, there was a, there was a, de a desire to finish. So I always felt like it would get done when that report came out that the Clippers quote unquote, the Clippers and Lakers voted to not finish the season. I was shocked. I was floored. I didn't really understand it. Um, you know, we met with uh, some of our guys to get their perspective. And it was really just like an unofficial poll of like, how are you feeling in the moment? You know what I mean? And, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, some more conversations continued to happen and it, it became clear that, you know, we were all uh, interested in, in staying to play. Let's wrap with some fun questions. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, the Denver shot game two, Anthony Davis three-pointer. LeBron is the screener. Had you used that play before? And what's the, what's like option A? What's the first shot <laughs> you're looking for on that play? 
Option A is uh, for LeBron to break open for a catch and shoot. And um, option B is the other three guys have freedom to uh, to break through the ball without rules. You know what I mean? And uh, that makes it hard for the defense to, to scout or to, to tell what's coming next. And, um, you know, I think we had a guy cutting through the basket and uh, obviously AD, you know, broke open to the wing. Um, he got himself open. Rajan made a great read. You know, Rajan's the passer we use uh, in, in a lot of those uh, catch and shoot situations because he can put it on the money and he knows who to go to. And uh, I, I believe he made eye contact with AD. Like, you know, you're going to be you're going to be the one that's going to be open. You know what I mean? So I think Rajan deserves as much credit for that shot as Anthony does, knocking it down. And um, what a moment in Lakers history! Had you used it before the play? Well, we run that play throughout throughout all games. Games, yeah, yeah. It's not just the yeah. end of it's not just the end of game or end of quarter play. Correct. Yep. Um, is is there any time for you to get your way into Space Jam too? Is it is it? I know it's in the can. Is there any way to like go back and edit yourself in? Is there any hope for this? Nope. I don't. <laughs> I'm not asked. I'm not really interested. Um, you know, if I was asked. You know, I would do whatever they wanted, but uh, you know, I've not, I've not tried to pursue that at all. Well, try, coach. It's Space Jam too. <laughs> well, basketball coach. Okay, fine. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I was texting with a couple of your players yesterday, and one of them, who shall remain nameless, said, "Ask coach about somehow using." the late '90s Eddie Murphy Martin Lawrence comedy Life, which I have not seen as part of like a film session or a game planning tool. So now I got to see this movie and I, I, what is the connect? How did you possibly connect this to an NBA game? Okay. So uh, I'll try to keep this as a short story. First of all, I didn't see the movie either. I've not <laughs> seen this movie, but my former assistant coach, Popeye Jones, every time he would see someone that one of our video guys dressed up, you know, he, he would, he would say, where, where you think you're going? Like, where the hell you think you're going? And I'm like, where you keep, what is that from? You know, <laughs> it was just from the Eddie Murphy movie life, you know, it's from that movie. So from a basketball standpoint, every time, you know, we always have, try to have like little fun phrases for executing principles on the floor. So uh, to me, every time somebody contained the basketball, like a driver is trying to get by you to his right and you contain him and he tries to get by you to his left and you contain him and he just can't get by you. So like, for some reason, Popeye's voice kept popping into my head saying, where the hell you think you're going? You know what I mean? So I wanted our, our containment defenders to have that mindset that, you know, every time somebody's trying to drive past you, like you just got to look at them. Where you, where you think you're going? <laughs> so we uh, we started splicing that into our positive defensive tapes. Love it. Love it. <laughs> now, I, I don't know what the movie's about, but I, now I want to see it. Um, uh, and uh, Old School was involved at some point, too, which is a movie I have seen. It is a little more recent than, than life. Uh, old School has got a lot of iconic comedy scenes. How, wait, tell me which one is in there. Yeah, and it, it was during the finals we used that, which is, you know, you don't really think you're going to be using levity in your film sessions uh, during the finals. But um, everybody thinks the most, you know, the, the best scene in, in Old School is, is either the, the Frank the Tank scene or, or the Streakin' scene. But they're wrong. The best scene in that movie is the dart scene. You remember the dart scene? That is a great scene. <laughs> Where he shoots a tranquilizer dart in his neck. A stiffer yes. is in there from American Pie. Yes. And, um, yeah, so, like, our bench was so nuts throughout the whole playoff run. Like, the celebrations, the jumping out on the court, the doing the goggles. Like, the, the refs every game telling me, like, these guys got to get back on the bench. Like, this is out of control. So, um, you know, there was a little dust up, and I wanted to sell the, the message that um, – you know, you could get suspended. You know, if there's an altercation, you guys are out there. Like you guys, you guys are crazy. I like that, but let's, you know, let's make sure you guys are back. So, you know, I, that's the scene that came to my mind when, when Will Ferrell's got a dart in his neck and he's looking at the other guy who's, man, I like you. <laughs> You're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, this is my message to you guys. I love the energy. I love you guys, but you're crazy. And you need to, you need to kind of get it under control. I love it. <laughs> I, I, that, that is a great scene. They do that. That that scene is filmed very well. The slow mo, and then he falls into the pool. And what song is playing when he falls into the pool? Hello, uh, whatever the "Hello Darkness, My Old Friend" song is playing when he falls into the pool. Um, right. 
Um, I love it. Uh, all right, coach. And I also heard rap lyrics, ludicrous lyrics. Is this, is this true? Yeah, that's B Shaw brought that to my, my system in, in Indiana. Cause you know, with post spacing, like as the cutter goes, like the next man has to be on the wheel. Like you're all connected, you know? So he's, you know, he used to, he used to say, Hey, this is this house post spacing is when you break to the wing, the next guy's got to break too. It's like the ludicrous song. When I move, you move just like that. So, so that's, that's what we said. Like, okay, this guy broke to, you know, this guy cut to the basket. So when he moves, you move. And every time I'd say that, I'd be like, just like that. <laughs> Great stuff, yeah. coach. Uh, last Can question. Last question. Um, we can't celebrate things normally right now, obviously. Um, do you have any plans to celebrate this? Like, I don't know if you can have some friends come over to your house, like uh, have a little socially distanced beer or something. Is there, is there any, is there any, or maybe you have a, some sort of secluded vacation plan for your family? Is there anything you can do to sort of mark this moment that would be special to you? We're trying to figure that out. Um, you know, I think uh, trying to get on uh, maybe some zoom calls, you know, like we did over the hiatus, what they call the zoom happy hour type of type yeah. of deals. You know, uh, I think there's going to be a, an opportunity to connect with some of my friends back in Boston, back in Florida, back in Indiana, family members from Jersey, you know, just doing some things like that. We're out some drinks uh, over Zoom, unfortunately. Best we well, can make the best of it, right? Make the best of it. Well, that's that's what you've done your whole career. You know, I remember when, Thank you. when Jim O'Brien got fired and you got promoted, there was this collective sense of like, wait, who? Like what that Frank who? <laughs> and, and you just roll with it and you keep rolling with it. And this is super well deserved. And it's 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 nothing but hard work and humanity. Uh and obviously um great talent on your team is it, that's yes. that's a prerequisite to winning the championship, no matter who the coach is. Um, but I, I just I'm thrilled for you and it's well deserved. And just thank you for coming on and giving us a little time and perspective on what this one of a kind season has been like for you. Happy to do it, Zach, and uh, I really appreciate your, all your support over the years, man. Appreciate it. Coach, have a great summer. Get some family time, and uh, we will talk to you whenever, whenever. I don't know. We'll talk to you at some point. Thanks, Coach. Look forward to it. Take care.